All right. Well, I think we have a good amount of people brought in. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Kaner. I'm a 2L at New York Law School, and I'll be moderating today's panel on arbitration and professional sports. I want to first thank New York Law School and the Alternative Dispute Resolution Skills Program for giving me the opportunity to moderate this panel. I also want to thank the Sports Law Society and my professor, Dan Lust, for helping organizing this panel. The last people I want to thank are the upcoming Sports Law Society Symposium sponsors, Pardalis and Novacic, Bella Wood Sports Endeavors, and Moho Interactive. Lastly, I'm sure you all, all are aware this is a CLE accredited event and attendees will receive CLE credit for attending this panel discussion. As the moderator, I'll be reading three codes throughout the panel discussion. Please be sure to record the codes once we announce them as we are not allowed to announce each code more than twice. You should receive an email following the panel discussion with the form that you should submit to receive credit for, att for attending. With all that out of the way, let's start the discussion. Well, actually, I messed that one up. Let's introduce our speakers. And I'm, there's no better way to introduce our speakers than let them introducing themselves. So would anyone like to start? Yeah, I'll start. This is Greg Clifton. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Lewis Brisboy. I want to thank uh, everyone for the opportunity to participate in this panel today. I've had the pleasure of doing this previously, and uh, it's been <clears throat> very enjoyable, and I appreciate all the attendees. Um, hopefully, we're going to be able to discuss a number of issues that people might be interested in and how arbitration uh, arises in the professional sports area. Uh, we're seeing more and more arbitration type forums, as well as alternative dispute resolution methods that are being used in professional sports right now. And I want to spank, thank my other panelists for joining me today. And I'm looking forward to having an interesting discussion with all of them. And I'm interested in also hearing any questions anyone might have during the course of our presentation. And I want to thank Ben for hosting. Uh, you're doing a great job as a 2L. I guess I'll hop in. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Chris Dubert. Uh, I'm an attorney with the law firm Constangi, Brooks, Smith & Profit, a national management side labor and employment firm. Um, I've been involved in, in sports basically my entire career. And as it related to arbitration, my principal experience early in my career, I did a lot of uh, arbitrations on behalf of NFL players with the NFL, uh, commissioner discipl disciplinary proceedings, uh, grievance arbitrations, drug and steroid policy appeals. And I also uh, helped a major league baseball club do salary arbitration for a couple of years. And hi, everybody. I'm Mark Conrad. Uh, I am the, I guess, the token academic on the panel full time. I teach at Fordham University's Gabelli School of Business, where I direct its sports business initiative. I teach various uh, law and ethics courses there, uh, uh, including sports law uh, for business students. I also serve as an adjunct at St. John's University School of Law and at Columbia University's uh, International Sports uh, Management Program. So uh, I do cover arbitration in my classes, general dispute resolution, can try to come up with uh, and discuss an international bent to arbitration because it's really important in the Olympic sphere, uh, something that's really not that uh, reported heavily in the United States. And I look forward to uh, discussing, debating, and analyzing with my co-panelists. That was well said from all of our panelists. So I think now it's time to start the discussion. Does anyone want to start talking about how the NFL or even the MLB arbitration system operates and their experience working with them? Sure, I'll jump in on that one if you don't mind, Ben. And then I'm sure uh, Chris and, and the professor will jump in as well. Uh, okay. You know, the, the Major League Baseball arbitration system is a very interesting system, which has evolved over time. Uh, where every year it seems to be have a little different twist to it. This year, uh, we had, uh, if my memory's right, 19, I think, cases that actually went to hearing, uh, and there was a larger number of cases that were won by the management side. Uh, I'm a little bit of a rarity. I was an agent for uh, about 20 years, and the last 10 years I've been on the management side, so I'm a rarity in the sense that I've presented arbitration cases both on behalf of individual players, uh, through the Players Association, working with them, and I'm also now the last... 10 or 11 years had the pleasure of working on the management side, representing teams in salary arbitration. So it's a very unique experience. And I'll just take a minute or two, and then I'll let Chris and Mark comment, and then we can, I can add perhaps some more. But the system, the way uh, salary arbitration is created in baseball is a 
there are three arbitrators that give an opportunity to, to render their opinion and to reach a decision. There's one chief arbitrator who oversees the process. What's very unique about it, and any of the people who are participating today in the audience, unlike other labor arbitration cases, which can be a day, two days, as long as it's necessary to call all the witnesses, the uniqueness of the salary arbitration process in Major League Baseball is that literally each side has one hour to present your case. And then there's a rebuttal phase of well, which is 30 minutes each for, for either side. Uh, and that one hour is really monitored very closely. Uh, this year, I was fortunate enough to represent a team, and I had two hearings this year on their behalf. And literally, there was about 10 seconds left when I finished my one presentation. So bottom line is it's watched very closely by the three arbitrators, who in fact are labor arbitrators, uh, who have a little bit of knowledge, perhaps a, a significant amount of knowledge about Major League Baseball. And the process is controlled through the collective bargaining agreement, which, which limits the information that can be provided by either side in support of their position. Uh, the way the arbitration system works in baseball, each party submits a number. Uh, the player's number is obviously usually higher than the team's number. And the arbitrators have one decision and one decision only is that player worthy of $1, technically one penny, I guess, or more than the midpoint of the two numbers, or is it one penny less than the midpoint of those numbers? If it's one penny or a dollar more, a hundred dollars or a million dollars more than the submission, the player will win if it's more than that midpoint. And if it's below the midpoint, the team will win. So it can be a very interesting process. And what we've seen over the last several years, more and more teams are adopting what we call a file and trial philosophy, which means if the parties are not able to settle the dispute or the, the numbers between the two of them, uh, and their numbers that are exchanged by the parties with the player submitting his number and the team submitting their number, Ultimately, there is a hearing that is then held, and this year they was down in Florida, and that hearing will then determine uh, what the appropriate salary is for that player for the upcoming season. So I'll let Chris comment on the professor a little bit, and then I can jump back in for a little bit more information. Yes, yeah, so in baseball, I'll try and provide some, some historical background, which is um, many of you probably have heard of baseball's reserve clause, which meant players were uh, tied to their club in perpetuity for so long as the club wanted, um, and there were a, a trilogy of Supreme Court cases that that uh, upheld that upheld the, the reserve clause. But in the, in the 70s, uh, uh, baseball players through their union and through some creative uh, arguments were able to sort of undo the reserve clause. And so the salary arbitration process came out of that and the first collective bargaining agreements in the 1970s. Um, and so salary arbitration is not for everyone uh, in, in hockey. I don't know if anyone knows the hockey is, a, is broader rules, but but baseball is generally players with three to six years experience. And then there's something called super twos. Those are players with two years of experience uh, or at least two years of service time uh, and, and are in the seven highest 17 percent of service time in their in their class, so to speak. And so um, when you go into arbitration, the players, it's not as if hey, a third-year guy just hit 40 home runs and he should be compared to Mike Trout or Aaron Judge or anything, he's only going to be compared to other, um, you know, second or, or third-time eligible candidates uh, is what they're – salary arbitration eligible candidates. It's a, so they're, they're compared to, to very light uh, players. Um, and uh, the, 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 the criteria that can be used in determining an appropriate salary, as Greg was saying, is set forth in the collective bargaining agreement – uh, all the types of, of stats uh, that you would imagine and, and uh, honors and uh, even, I think, press clippings and things like that, which has become a little, can occasionally be, be a little acrimonious because, um, you know, teams have to go in and, and they hire people like Greg potentially to say bad things about the players. Uh, and oftentimes the players are in the hearing and occasionally they take that very personally and it can Sort of damage the relationship between the club and the and the player. Um, maybe Greg, I don't know if you, you might have some thoughts on that. Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll jump in before I let the professor speak, and I apologize. Yeah, that is an interesting point, and it's something that comes up on a fairly regular basis. Uh, you know, the reality is it's not a friendly environment. It doesn't mean it has to be acrimonious in the sense of being almost slanderous. But again, you're going in; it's a statistical analysis, so you're going to be comparing the player's performance. There's two components. One is on a platform year basis, meaning the preceding season, as well as a career total in terms of those numbers. So again, the, the collective bargaining agreement doesn't give us any guidance as to which factor is of greater importance, but typically the platform year 
is something that's used more for players who are beyond their first time arbitration eligible status. If you're a first time arbitration eligible status player, probably your career numbers become more relevant because it's the first time you've ever been able to have your salary determined outside of the direct negotiations between your agent and that team. So when you do go in the room, uh, it's a very intimidating process. If you're not used to it, as Chris will tell you, you know, you probably have about 30 people in a huge conference room and you're, it's, it, the formality is very intense. I mean, it's, it's not an easygoing, friendly environment. I try to break that down a little bit from the management side. And I did the same thing from the agent side because I don't think it has to be vicious in the sense of presenting it. Uh, if you're an agent, you have to make sure your player understands he's going to go into that room and no one, you're a competitor, you're an athlete, you don't go on the mound to pitch or go into the batter's box to hit without an, uh, really an intense feeling of success. I want to be successful at what I'm doing. There's no difference in salary arbitration. The same is true from the management side. The management side does not necessarily want to go in and destroy the relationship, but unfortunately, the sensitivity is sometimes high because some of the players don't think there should be any negativity discussed whatsoever. Uh, if a player goes into an arbitration hearing ex expecting that, they're going to be disappointed because, again, management's job, which is the opposite of the players and the agent's job, is to talk about some of these negative things that happen, whether they be negative performances, whether they be blown saves, whether they be poor starts, or whether it be, you know, horrible months of September uh, performance-wise. The entire season, their entire career is open to interpretation. So that is one of the reasons why it does become a little acrimonious. And if the player is not prepared for that environment, um, it's probably going to be very difficult for them. And I, I can tell you as an agent, I had numerous players over the course of my career as an agent where I did not feel as though the player would have been able to go through and deal with an arbitration hearing because they were very sensitive and they didn't want to hear the negative things. So I went into the negotiations uh, anticipating that from my client's perspective doesn't mean you didn't feel like you were ready to go to arbitration, but I realized certain players don't have the mindset to be able to go in and handle an arbitration hearing and the negativity that's going to arise, even though it's not meant to be intentionally negative, but the facts are if you had poor performances, they're going to be mentioned in the course of a hearing. So I'll just add a couple of very quick points because I think the um, answers so far were really comprehensive, both on the history side and on the modern practical side. Um, when the system first came to be in 1976, it was thought that was a victory for the players because the rule is then and now a player has to have six years of service to be an unrestricted free agent or a free agent in baseball generally. And it was thought, well, let's have the player, quote, still on the team for those three years and have arbitrations. But arbitrations in the early years tended to be at least more pro player. And I think in more recent years, management has understood the system better. And, and first, you'd have a relative paucity of arbitrations. I don't think there are that many uh, as uh, maybe in the past. And second, uh, there are risks involved. And I was actually going to ask the point uh, when Greg was an agent, I mean, did you um, really recommend most of your players not go into the room because it could be unpleasant? And do you find today on the other side, representing management, do you find that most players in the arbitrations you've represented were in the room and have to hear the negatives? You know, that, that's a great question, Professor. I mean, the one thing that I have noticed is, which has made it a little bit more challenging from an advocate's perspective from either side, is the numbers tend to be to tighter or closer together. You know, historically, uh, going back and looking at arbitration cases, you might have, you know, a $4 million filing by a player and a $2.5 million filing by a team. So, wow, there was a million and a half dollars at stake here. We win the case. We're, you know, all smiling. We lose the case. You got two and a half million dollars at stake. So I think from an agent's perspective back then, and I call it the family factor, you know, a lot of times a player would say to me, hey, Greg, I don't want to risk a million and a half dollars. I know those are the two filing numbers in my example. Um, can we come up with some solution here? I'll take less than I wanted, but I don't want to put the 1.5 million at stake. So a lot of times the negotiations would proceed with that type of guidance. The other thing that I experienced back then was there was less of those, what I said, file and trial. You tended to negotiate literally sometimes up to the room. Um, you know, a few years back when I was representing the, the Arizona Diamondbacks in a case, we literally, I got tapped on the shoulder by the agent as we were sitting down with the arbitrators. And he said, can you have a minute? Can we talk? And we literally went outside and find a way to resolve the case. And my, my gut tells me he wanted to do that because I think he was afraid if he lost the case, he was going to lose the client. 
So the one thing I want, I use that as an example, because from an agent's perspective, success is crucial in the sense that maintaining that relationship with your player, if you lose, every agent in America is going to be all over your player trying to convince them to switch and join a different agency. From the management side, it's sometimes challenging when the numbers that obviously you've seen lately get really tight, because trying to distinguish between a player files at 212, the team files at 1050, and there's $150,000 difference between the two, which really means it's a split of $75,000. The, the, the information and the detail that's necessary to try and distinguish that tight of a range of numbers makes it really challenging, I think, for both sides, frankly. And the one other thing that I want to mention that Chris touched on, we do not have any common law in the baseball salary arbitration world. There are no written decisions in case anybody's wondering about that. So you can't go back and say, well, you know, in Jones versus the Yankees in uh, you know 2001, the arbitrators held. That's intentional. So there are obviously examples of exhibits that have been presented over the years, perhaps on a certain example or a certain type of player. But in terms of a common law that can be referred to, there is none. And now frequently in this generation of cases, we don't have written briefs, which any lawyers are wondering. It's more of a slide presentation. And we usually average somewhere around 100 to 110 slides that are presented in an hour. So it's a pretty rapid fire in terms of information we're providing to the three arbitrators, that's for sure. Uh, Greg, really quickly, didn't you represent a Tampa Bay Rays player who recently had a viral tweet about your arbitration case? Yes, I did. <laughs> we represented the team. <laughs> and it was interesting because, you know, he, he really did a good job of, of sort of explaining things from his perspective. And I think the interesting angle that I thought was disappointing uh, because he didn't understand, he, he was, his thought process was that the arbitrators didn't really understand baseball and they didn't understand the nuances. And, and I can tell you in all my years of doing this on both sides, I've never seen a series of arbitrators who didn't understand the nuances of the sport. I had it once in hockey uh, where I had an arbitrator who didn't understand the nuances of a hockey contract, but in baseball, I've never had that experience any arbitration, any arbitrator panel that we've been in front of on both sides, as I said, have always appeared to be very inf well informed, ask good questions if they're going to ask a question, and are always very attentive to the presentations. And I think that player, unfortunately, was probably frustrated with the process. Again, most people don't understand what goes on. And if you ever read some of the, the tweets that followed his tweet, a lot of the people who were trying to support his position were trying to echo sentiments and things that really weren't adequate or, or we're not adequate, we're not actually correct in terms of making arguments that unfortunately a player can't present during the hearing. So uh, he was frustrated, he vented. I guess the one thing I'll say, he was nice, he complimented us on the management side, but it was nice to hear, have a player say that we did a nice job in terms of presenting our case, which was kind of nice. Greg, mm -hmm. since you mentioned it, hockey, um, I wonder if you can compare and contrast a little, because I know at least the, the criteria is a little more complicated because age is involved in determining who, who can have a hearing and also the arbitrator can select a two-year contract, but are, are there, it's not last best offer and there are written decisions. Is that right or no? That's correct. And, and one other thing with this, I'm going back several years when I was just referenced to an arbitrator, I didn't think I understood the process back then there was always what we call every contract had an option part of it, but that option part of it was really recognized as a time to renegotiate and the player had the right to go to arbitration to sort of have that option year determined. And the arbitration we had, the arbitrator in writing concluded that, no, sorry, he's already agreed to that contract, kind of arguing, I don't even know why you're in front of me, because his contract has already been agreed to, he signed that agreement, and the option is going to you know, come into play here. So that was a little bit frustrating. But the one other thing which is unique about the hockey system um, is that there are what, what we call walkaway rights. So the bottom line is if a decision, the, the team feels though the decision is inappropriate, and has awarded the player too much. And again, in my four million, two and a half million dollar example, baseball arbitrators only have the one or the other number to decide upon. Hockey arbitration, they could say you're worth two, six, two, seven, three, two, whatever. There's no limitation on where they could go. So that makes that system a little bit more challenging in some ways, because, you know, if you're only going to get a hundred thousand dollars more than you, uh, than the team offered, is it worth going? Do you want to take that risk? So a little bit different system. Uh, but also something that's clearly negotiated between the parties to the collective bargaining process. So now that we've briefly mentioned two different sports systems of arbitrations, I think it'd be a good time to mention the biggest case probably right now dealing it with sports arbitration, which is the Brian Flores case. I think, Chris, could you speak about this case in the NFL system of arbitration now? Sure. So um, 
I'll give some more background. We've just discussed salary arbitration. Baseball and the NHL are the only sports that have salary arbitration. All of the leagues have some kind of arbitration mechanism for various dispute resolutions within the collective bargaining agreement. The NFL probably is the most complex. Um, there are various arbitration processes for different kinds of disputes. First of all, I'll just mention quickly, there's an injury grievance arbitration. So if you've been injured, um, the team is required to pay you your salary for as long as you are, are injured. And there's a process by which you say, hey, uh, I was actually, if the team cuts you, you can say, look, I have doc records and say I was going to be injured for six weeks. The team says two weeks. There's an arbitration process for resolving that. Most of them settle. Then there's a what's called a system arbitration. And this flows from antitrust lawsuits that were settled all the way back into the 90s. And what they have, this is called a system arbitrator, and they're responsible for, for hearing arbitrations related to sort of core economic parts of the collective bargaining agreement, free agency, salary cap, um, and, and other contract rules. Um, those are the, the types of rules that would be governed by or, or subject to antitrust scrutiny are designated to be heard by a specific arbitrator. Then there is non-injury grievance arbitrations, and these are regular sort of uh, standard contract disputes. If a player thinks his contract was violated in some way, he can file a non-injury grievance arbitration. Um, non Everything we've heard so far I'm talking about is neutral um, arb arbitrators that are, are jointly selected by the league and the union. Uh, then we get into probably the most controversial aspect, which is commissioner discipline uh, under Article 46 of the collective bargaining agreement, which is still a, a situation in which Roger Goodell is the ultimate arbitrator. Um, leaving that, and there's been lots of litigation about that, that that Mark and we may touch on a little bit, but let's talk about the Brian Flores situation. Brian Flores, an, an NFL coach, now defensive coordinator of the Minnesota Vikings, um, brought a federal lawsuit, class action lawsuit, alleging racial discrimination against the NFL and a handful of NFL clubs. Two other uh, black coaches, Ray Horton and uh, Wilkes, joined the lawsuit and the NFL moved to compel arbitration. Importantly, the coaches are not unionized. And so these coaches all signed uh, employment agreements that are standard in part. I wouldn't, they're not necessarily adhesion contracts. Um, uh, but importantly, within somewhere in every contract, the coaches agreed to be bound by NFL rules, the Constitution, the NFL bylaws, things of that nature. Um, the provision, they all had arbitration provisions that varied in detail and length and specificity. Um, and because some of them, some of them were older, some of them were newer. In any event, the NFL, in my opinion, largely prevailed on their motion to compel arbitration. Um, they said uh, Flores's claims related to Miami, the Miami Dolphins, for whom he was head coach from 2019, 2020 to 2021, I believe, um, had to be arbitrated because he had an agreement with them. Um, the other two coaches, same thing, their claims against um, the, the Titans and the Cardinals, because they had specific employment relation uh, contracts with them, had to be arbitrated, and any claims related against the NFL related to those claims also had to be arbitrated. Um, and the arbitration process, again, redirects the NFL constitutional bylaws, which says Commissioner Goodell is the arbitrator. Um, that's uh, so. Chris, can I jump in and ask you one quick question? Yeah, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you. The, the issue of Goodell in that role, is that particularly subject to the collective bargaining process? I just wanted the audience to understand that, that certainly the players have the ability, I would believe, through the collective bargaining process to challenge that when it comes to some of those disciplinary issues. Yeah. So for the players for 20 years now, um, since since really Goodell became commissioner, Goodell became commissioner 06 and really started imposing cracking down on, on players. Uh, the NFL PA, there's been two CBAs negotiated since then, and uh, the union has always made it a priority to try and whittle away or remove the commissioner's authority, and they've generally been unsuccessful. Uh, and so the commissioner, as to the players, retains that authority. But as to the coaches, again, there's no collective bargaining relationship. Right. And so uh, they're subject to whatever whatever they agreed to. In practice, and, and I've been I've been involved in multiple arbitrations with Goodell, theoretically, where the, the authority theoretically is embedded in him at the top. 
But Goodell is not a lawyer. And so there's a variety of options he often takes. Uh, one is he, he sometimes appoints Jeff Pash, uh, the NFL general counsel, to, to preside over an arbitration. Sometimes he appoints former um, lawyers formerly associated with the NFL or NFL clubs, Bob Wallace and Harold Henderson, um, to, to hear uh, cases. Um, sometimes uh, in really high profile ones that, that already have litigation going, such as, um, well, the, the Ray Rice uh, uh, situation um, and the Deshaun Watson, Watson situa situation, which didn't have litigation, but threatened litigation. Um, he appointed former federal judges as arbitrators. And then there's a sort of a third option, which I anticipate he will use in this case, which is to appoint someone friendly to the NFL, but not absurdly so. And so in the Watson case, he had appointed as an arbitrator on because they had the right to appeal um, an attorney who had worked with the NFL um, as outside counsel, but on unrelated issues. And so in this situation, I think it would look bad for the NFL to appoint their primary labor outside counsel, which would be Aiken Gump or Proskow or someone like that. But I would anticipate that they will find a friendly enough um, person to oversee oversee the, the hearing. Um, in any event, the, the, the coaches have appealed and, and various professors have opined that it's fundamentally unfair, et cetera. I'll, I'll pause there for now. <laughs> Well, yes. let's let our professor yes. opine well, on well, it. Yes. <laughs> oh, I've got a lot to real opine quick. on in this case, in these cases. Uh, you know, uh, Mark, first, real quick, we just got to okay. do this CLE credit real, really quickly. We'll get okay. the CLE code word off because we're definitely going to continue this conversation. Okay. So for everybody that needs the CLE credits, the first code word is hockey. I'll repeat it one more time. So please listen for the CLE credit. It is hockey. Thank you, everyone. And Mark, please. Oh, hockey is my favorite sport. Great name. But anyway, let's get there are so many issues in the NFL system. Let's call it the grievance arbitration system that really pose fascinating questions. In the Deshaun Watson uh, decision, you had a, a federal judge, retired federal judge that made a recommendation of a six game suspension because there, in a sense, didn't she look at precedent or didn't she look at like this was what the code was and didn't want to go above it. But ultimately, um, the party settled it, as you said. Had it gone to Goodell, uh, it would have made a very interesting situation because most likely he would have tried to have a greater suspension, uh, given the allegations, given the publicity, given all that's happened. And then it probably would go to court with a motion to vacate it. It'd be interesting how a court would look at the fact that in this case, you did have a retired federal judge at the outset saying, this is my thought and recommendation based on past interpretation, past standards in the act. And I think it would have been an interesting question. I think both sides were probably worried enough uh, and given the nature of this and given the fact that the contract was structured, Watson's stru contract was structured in a very interesting way. That year of the suspension season, let's call it, was it like he made a million dollars? And then every other year, he'd get like $45 million uh, in his long-term contract. So you have to wonder about the good faith or lack thereof good faith by Cleveland in structuring the contract this way, given the, you know, shall let's call it the baggage that he carried uh, from his prior uh, team, prior time uh, down in Texas. So then I think uh, that writes an interesting issue as well. Uh, the second issue in a lot of these, and you know, even with Flores, which is a kind of a different issue, is that I took this, uh, that an arbitration law, it was a victory for the NFL. On the court of public opinion, it was not because the case can still proceed among some other teams in the public. And when you talk about litigation, you're gonna talk about discovery and what, could come out in this situation could be embarrassing to the NFL on the general public side. So I think that uh, it's not totally a victory. Uh, it's a partial victory at best, but if you're looking at it from arbitration, yes, indeed it is. I, I would totally agree with that. 
Um, the third point is that, again, um, when you think of arbitration law, there always is that standard over your head of evident partiality of an arbitrator. And that is something that if an arbitrator shows that, a court could vacate it. Well, in the Goodell situation, how much evident partiality do you have to show? Uh, it's clearly a flawed system by ideal, by an ideal situation. But as you know, Chris said correctly, hey, this is what's agreed to in the contract for the coaches. And with the union, this is what was agreed to by the NFL, and the NFLPA, which is what the courts have said. You know, you made your bed, you have to sleep in it. Uh, and uh, the courts, you know, and you just see how it is so hard for courts to go and vacate arbitration rulings. It really takes a lot, even though in certainly the Brady case, you just had to wonder, you know, it was so obvious that <laughs> this is going to be uh, a not ideal situation, to put it kindly. And that's the fault of the system there. And whether you talk about unconscionability, you talk about manifest disregard for the law, you talk about these are terms that are thrown around, uh, it does really open a lot of questions. So, you know, I was one of the few people I was out there in this area that I felt that the Second Circuit was wrong in the Brady case, for example. But well, it's okay, interesting we'll in terms of the discipline uh, and the collective bargaining. Uh, you know, this has been an issue that I know has been talked about by player reps for a long time, even long before even the Ben Rosselsberger suspension going back probably, what, a dozen years now. And it's interesting, which Chris mentioned, there have been multiple collective bargaining negotiations. And really, during both of those negotiations, nothing has changed and nothing has impacted Commissioner Goodell's power. And I've always thought that's really interesting that the players maybe could make some trades, as we all know what goes on in collective bargaining negotiations, but they haven't prioritized that is a highlight and an important issue. And I've heard certain people say it's because only a handful of players are impacted by it. So we don't want to trade away things that impact all of us yeah. for only a handful, handful of no uh, of bad deal, bad deal people who are doing the wrong things. And Can I think I that's why it's that? hung around. Oh, once you're done. No, go ahead. Uh, I just want to add something on that. You know, the nature of collective bargaining obviously is give and take. The NFLPA has a a more difficult situation there than I think the other unions because they have more members and yep. the range of talent in the NFL from the players that are these um, players that practice, you know, just do practices uh, to your stars is incredibly, incredibly wide. It doesn't mean that you don't have this in other sports. You certainly do, you know, between Otani and, you know, some journeyman baseball player, but it seems in the NFL, you have a wider range. And I think that it came down to the fact that the players union did not want to give up on the financial side anymore to get the neutral arbitration system. I mean, I'm not speaking for the union. Uh, it's, it, I'm just surmising this, but it seems that way because they couldn't shake that in the last two CBAs and felt it's not worth the battle, as you said, for a very few number of players. But it does show a certain weakness because that CBA was barely approved uh, at the dawn of the COVID era. It was like in March or February 2020 that was approved. And it was really by, what, 100 votes. And that didn't make the union look too good either, because, you know, if you're the union selling an agreement, you really want an 85, 90 percent approval. You know, you want a mandate that your members are on your side. And I think, and this is some, I've, I've heard speculation in the media, that if you took out the developmental players from that cohort, it could have gone down, but I don't know that. So the hand of the union was not the strongest to begin with for a number of reasons. And I think that's why they are, shall we say, stuck with the system that we have in place. I think you're right. That's a good point. I was just going to say, Professor Phillips, you have asked a question about, you know, Mark, you were talking about the possibility of vacating the arbitration award, but um, obviously part of Flores' argument here was that the arbitration agreement was unenforceable from the outset. And this is a much broader issue, as, as many of you probably all uh, already know, throughout American uh, employment and labor law, where arbitration agreements with employees are increasingly subject and, uh, to judicial scrutiny and being unenforced in a variety of ways, particularly in California. And um, so, but I, the, the Southern District of New York, Judge Caproni in this situation did not find those arguments availing and, and neither do I. Again, Flores is a, a well-paid uh, in-demand coach. Uh, he was certainly represented by an agent and likely counsel. 
in negotiating his um, his contract. Um, I wouldn't see any grounds on which it wouldn't or shouldn't be an enforceable contract. Well, One Chris, other thing I'll, I'll add as well, the, you know, an effort to vacate an arbitration decision, once it gets to arbitration, assuming the preliminary challenges to the arbitrability of the issue, but once an arbitrator has an option or a team of arbitrators like in baseball, um, very, very, very difficult to ever vacate an arbitration award. Uh, I mean, there's a certain standard and every state's got a little bit of a different standard, but certainly undue influence and uh, obviously, if, a, if an arbitrator was bribed or an arbitrator was, God forbid, drunk or under the influence of drugs or something during the hearing, um, those are the standard ones. But no matter what, it's a very, very difficult process to overturn or vacate an arbitrator's award. So that's why I think some of these preliminary challenges are so important that you were describing, Chris, because that's when a lot of the arguments have to take place. Because once you get in that arbitration forum, it's going to be very difficult to vacate any award if you're not happy with it. Chris, specifically with the Brian Flores, why did some of the cases get removed to federal court and why did some of them get pushed to arbitration? Yeah, so the the he um, some of the defendants, the other there's five or six teams that are named defendants. Again, the Titans, Cardinals, and uh Vi and not Vikings, Dolphins, the coaches had employment agreements with them. And um, so those ones were were pushed to arbitration. But Flores also named the Giants and the Broncos and the Texans as defendants because those were was, those were teams with whom he had either interviewed or was potentially going to interview for a head coaching position. Uh, because he did not have um, an agreement and an explicit employment agreement with them, uh, it was too much of a reach to say that the arbitration agreements he agreed to in his actual employment contracts, say with the Dolphins, extended to those teams. I think, frankly, this, this is an area that the NFL can fairly easily clean up. Um, they can uh, amend the provision to say that uh, you have to arbitrate all claims against the NFL and, and, and its clubs uh, related to your arising out of your employment. Um, they've amended their arbitration language several times over the years in response to some of these rulings. So I anticipate they're, they're already working on that. Specifically with this one, wasn't it because uh, Commissioner Goodell didn't actually sign the second one. So the, the this is a, a different argument. The uh, for the 2022 season, Flores was the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, an assistant coach, and he had a contract. And it, kind of amazingly, he agreed to the standard language, which again incorporated um, dispute resolution through the NFL by reference the NFL Constitution and bylaws, which would have meant Goodell. The NFL made the argument that he was retroactively agreeing to arbitration. Um, the amazing thing is the contract is very explicit that it was not enforceable until Goodell signed it. And Goodell never signed it. And the federal judge, even she said in her ruling, she she prodded the NFL, like, are you sure these are all the, the documents? And the NFL said, yes, these are all the documents. And so she said that his steward contract was unenforceable. Um, and therefore, uh, that he could not have retroactively waived anything. I mean, that that's a clear screw up, uh, assuming the judge the judge got it right. So speaking, uh, sticking to a similar but different topic, does anyone want to speak on the John Gruden arbitra arbitration and lawsuit situation? Mark, you want to take the lead on that one? Yeah, no, I'll actually I'll punt on that one. No pun intended. I really haven't followed that case. Up. Yeah, so so that that's a good good. Comparison. So Gruden, former NFL coach, just like Flores, also has a brought a lawsuit against, importantly, he only sued the NFL. He was fired. The, the background is a mess. But um, as a result of investigation into the commanders and Daniel Snyder, and he had a whole bunch of really inappropriate and bad emails. And so he got fired by the Las Vegas Raiders. He settled with the Las Vegas Raiders, but he sued the NFL uh, I believe it's some sort of tortious interference claim saying the NFL leaked the bad emails, which caused him to lose his job. The NFL, same thing, uh, moved to compel arbitration. And there, a Nevada state court um, ruled in his in his favor, um, finding at least in part, I think there were a couple of grounds, but one of them, which was that, yes, it would be unfair for Goodell to, to over, over uh, see the arbitration. And therefore, the uh, the I want to be, I'd want to be more careful exactly as to the to the all the grounds, but nonetheless, that case can proceed 
in, um, in is proceeding in state court. In, in the Flores case, the judge footnoted, yeah, that Gruden case is interesting. That's Nevada law. I don't care. Uh, and Mark made a good point earlier, which we should point out, is the Southern District of New York is where the Deflategate Brady case was was um, handled. So the Second Circuit has generally been friendly to the NFL and Commissioner Goodell. And so Flores is in the Southern District. And so uh, if the NFL has to appeal this to the Second Circuit, I like their chances. If anyone, if no one else has any other thoughts on the Gruden stuff, I know, Chris, you had talked to us offline about how you represented some people involved with the Bounty Gate scandal. If you would like to talk about your experience with that situation. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to. Um, in the <laughs> 2011 or so season, uh, this is when the New Orleans Saints were quite good. And uh, Brett Favre was on the Vikings. And the Saints were alleged to have had a bounty scheme uh, that incentivized injuring opponent, opposing players with cash payouts. Uh, I was involved representing Jonathan. There were four, and his four Saints were, were disciplined very harshly, lengthy suspensions. I was involved representing Jonathan Vilma, who was a linebacker, a defensive captain for the Saints at the time, and has been since had been suspended for an entire season. Um, as I sort of indicated earlier, there were a variety of uh, there's a variety of arbitration mechanisms. In that case, there were multiple arbitrations because the alleged payments from the from the Saints, uh, Saints coaches allegedly paid some of the players. Um, that was potentially a salary cap violation. So there was one arbitration for that. And there were there was a, a, a non-injury grievance arbitration. And then there were, and then there was a commissioner discipline uh, process. Um, we, the players, went to federal court um, to challenge the discipline. And as a result of that process, uh, behind closed doors and talking with the judge, Goodell agreed to, um, he appointed his predecessor, Paul Tagliabu, to over, oversee a new arbitration to, to decide, decide discipline. And eventually, uh, Tagliabu, after a three-day hearing, vacated all the discipline. Um, and his reasoning was largely uh, if something wrong was done, one, this has been common practice in the NFL for 50 years or more. And two, it's the coach's fault. Um, they're responsible for the locker room. And so if the players did anything, they were doing it at the direction of, of the coaches. And so the players shouldn't be disciplined for that. Um, so that ultimately was a, was a win and set the stage for some of the later challenges because I'll tell you, behind closed door, the, the, the NFL refused to let us uh, know even who the uh, whistleblowers were or to confront them in an arbitration hearing. And a uh, federal judge in Louisiana was not very impressed with that from a due process perspective and told the NFL, you probably want to clean that up or I'm going to rule on this motion to vacate the arbitration decision. Um, so that's how we got a new hearing and new process uh, that ultimately resulted in a better outcome. And since then, the NFL has been more careful, I think, in some of the ways they go about handling due process for players. I think it's an interesting point to notice that you can see the distinction between relationships that are covered by a collective bar agreement and those relationships that are not. And you can see, as, as Chris has just been describing, a number of those scenarios he's dealt with, you know, if they're involving coaches, you can see it's the contract that becomes a very relevant uh, portion of the argument whether or not the contract was signed, whether it was approved, what's in the language in the contract, because again, there is no collective bargaining which is, which is mandating any specific provisions that must be pertaining to that, to, to that individual and must be included in the standard agreement. So a little bit different in terms of an important distinction that's with regard to employment agreements in sports that are covered by a CBA and those that are not. So that was a great explanation, Chris, thanks. And with that real quick, we'll just, do the second CLE credit word. I'll give everyone a second before I say it for the first time. So the second CLE credit word is going to be baseball. I'll give everyone a second and then I'll say it again because I can only say it two times. The second CLE credit is baseball. Thank you for that. And then I think we've talked a lot about how the NFL arbitration system works now. I think we should switch gears a little bit to how things are done abroad or internationally. I know that Mark specifically has some experience dealing with the 
Olympics and the uh, Court of Arbitration of Sport over there. Mark, if you would love to start talking about that. Oh, yes. That is a very interesting subject because uh, I've never been a cost arbitrator. Let me just say, I know cost arbitrators and have a knowledge of the system um, because there's a few issues with international law right off the bat. And one of the issues is that an international judgment by a court is generally or probably not going to be enforceable in the United States because full faith and credit does not apply. And because you have different systems of law, you know, a regular judgment from a Paris court may be looked upon with consternation in New York. Or a New York judgment will be looked upon with skepticism in, say, Ecuador. These are different systems. So in back in the 1950s, an international treaty was drafted called the New York Convention that essentially says that any signatory country to that convention uh, must generally uphold international arbitrations, meaning that the um, parties cannot run to the domestic court and try to completely disregard it because of different systems of law and confusion and the like. And there are exceptions to this too, but I know this is not an international law class, so I just wanted to give the background. Uh, there is no international sports court, although the media loves to call it that. There's a, a body called the Court of Arbitration for Sport. CAS was started about 30 years ago and has been adopted by most of the international sports federations and their domestic affiliates. CAS arbitrators could range from one or three uh, arbitrator panels. In the past, there was criticism that these arbitrators were generally more well-connected with sports federations and governing bodies than ideal. Uh, and at least in theory, there are more arbitrators now than there used to be. Many of the arbitrators that I have seen and read you know, are very knowledgeable about the system. And because you have the system that one, uh, it is an arbitration in an international vein, and two, uh, the country of jurisdiction and costs is Switzerland. So any appeal, no matter where it is, has to go to the Swiss courts. It becomes a somewhat problematic situation. So it is the other thing about uh, international arbitration is that you have issues like language, translation, things like that, which are a little bit more standardized in the United States. For example, if there's going to be a translation needed, you need a certified translator in the United States. Not necessarily so in cost rulings. And I knew of one case some time ago where the attorney for one side was actually the translator for both sides, which hmm. is kind of bizarre, you know, in, in uh, American standards, to put it mildly. So, you know, it is not an ideal system, but it is the system that is in place. Uh, at the Olympic Games, there is an ad hoc committee of arbitrators on site to deal with issues in the Olympics. Most of these arbitrations, by the way, Olympics or not, are going to be for doping or for qualifications and increasingly involving transgender issues where you're seeing this issue and it's going to continue, I suspect. So that's your general background. I mean, if I, I could talk about individual cases if you'd like, but that's sort of the general background of what the system is like today. Well, Mark, I know that you had mentioned to me earlier, i forgetting her name, but it's the girl that was caught for the Russian doping scandal. Yeah, the Valieva case. The Valieva yes. case. Yeah. Yes. So, and this is, you know, a, well, it is a bizarre set of circumstances for a number of reasons. And the three-judge panel had to deal with a provisional suspension issue in the middle of the Winter Olympic Games. This never should have happened. First, we all understand that for the last so many years, uh, Russian officials and um, members of various federations and organizations, not all, but many have been wrapped up in doping scandals. Because of that, no lab was certified in Russia to test samples. Valieva competed in a tournament around Christmas time to get on the team and the lab samples were sent to a uh, samples were sent to a lab in Sweden. 
because of COVID or for whatever reasons that I have yet to know, they waited a number of weeks for their results. The results come out in the middle of the Olympics. Valieva has just helped her team win what's called a team medal in skating. That's what they have now. You have really two competitions as a team and then individually. So the team wins, I believe they win the gold medal. You know, they have super skaters, um, very young skaters. I'll leave some of those issues aside. Well, in the middle of the singles competition, the result comes out that there was a positive test in this lab uh, in Sweden, the first test, and it was uh, awaiting more results, but it was a positive sample for some drug that she claimed her grandfather used and she took it by accident, you know, take that all for what you will. Well, the question was twofold here. One, should she be suspended? And two, do the rules change because she is 15 as opposed to an adult? And the panel had to deal with that. Meanwhile, you have an international storm going on, as you can imagine. First, the Russian Federation, Rusada, which is their anti-doping authority, gave her a suspension very shortly, but then rescinded it. When it was rescinded, a number of agencies went to arbitration and said, look, this violates the rules of the drug system, the WADA system, WADA system, and said she should be provisionally suspended. And that's the key, it was provisional. The panel had to make a decision in 24 hours. Imagine calling an arbitration in 24 hours, meaning that you had many teams affected, many skaters affected, and they ultimately ruled that because she was under 18, they could not say for sure that she was going to be with fault or likely without with fault and said you had to give her the benefit of the doubt to finish her competition. At the time of the ruling, it was thought that she was going to be the gold medal favorite. Of course, anybody that watched the Olympics saw what happened in a very dramatic and disturbing sight, quite frankly, that she did not win a medal. But as of now, they had to make the early decision. But, and here's the but and the problem with this system that you don't really have in the United States. You know, where the um, leagues and the unions have come up with a pretty airtight system of timing and schedule. Well, we are now a year after these games, and there has been no decision on whether she should be suspended or not. Mm-hmm. There have been incredible delays by the Russians. Uh, finally, um, the uh, UA, IOC and other organizations are bringing it back to cost to another arbitration panel to say, look, they got to make a, a suspension here or not and make a decision. That's where it stands. But meanwhile, you have an awful lot of athletes whose medals are either in jeopardy or unknown and have not had the ability to get their medals at the games because of this situation. And that includes American skaters who did well in the initial competition. And you know that is you know a psychological downer, if you will. But uh, it's because you have other countries involved, you have other agendas involved, it, it's a more complicated system and hardly a perfect one. And I think it's based on some of the ideal rules of arbitration in the United States, it would be wanting. Have we gotten any indication as to how much longer, if, if at no, all, they never make no. a decision? We wow. have no decision. I mean, there's really no accountability that way. And wow. of course, I mean, we're dealing with Rusada here. And, you know, they're not going to exactly make press conferences saying that, you know, we are going to do this and this is strategy and we want an expeditious ruling here. That's not happening. And plus, now we're coupled with a war in Ukraine. You know, some, on top of everything else, we have that hanging over everybody's head in so many other ways. And of course, uh, you know, involving, you know, the Ukrainian people foremost and first. But on the sports side, you know, it is really a crazy situation. And I don't really know when a decision will be made. And by the way, you know, for those of you who read the decisions, say in the NFL and whatever that are published, they're usually about 10 to 15 pages, I think, you know, Chris and Greg, more or less. These pages, are, these decisions are hundreds of pages long. You have to wade through them. Mm. Uh, it's in the driest of languages. And English, by the way, is an official language under the WADA. It's in English and French, so they have to be translated. 
And I'm sure many of your viewers, the viewers French is better than mine. I wouldn't try to read such a decision in French, but it's, it's, it's not an ideal system. Uh, whatever criticisms we have here in the States about the system in the NFL and other leagues and whatnot, it's problematic because it's simply more complex because of the players are more complex. Hmm. It's always very interesting trying to uh, assert or combine the geopolitics within the international sports, right? It's very tough. And the other question is to watch out for is going to be the transgender issue. WADA panels are going to have to deal with that. And I'll just will say that just this week, uh, World Athletics, which is the governing body for track and field, came out with a policy pretty much banning transgender people from competing as women. You can bet that's going to go to a cost arbitration. And you're going to ask arbitrators to deal with biological questions sociological questions. They've done it all in the past. And the approach is very interesting. I mean, it's a controversial issue. But in one ruling, they said not with a transgender, but with a, a, an athlete uh, that was born female, but had some uh, high testosterone, uh, said, we admit it's discrimination, but we think it's justified, which is something in a US court uh, would be uh, not that frequent, shall we say, given the general idea that discrimination based on, you know, how one would define gender is considered really not a good thing. But, you know, you're dealing also with international arbitrators coming from different legal systems too. I think who you're dealing with and what you're dealing with is very, very crucial in how these situations get resolved. I think I'd be very interested to know your thoughts of when the whole World Cup was going down in Qatar and the uh, tough geopolitical situation with all of that. It's Always, always gray, never black and white. Well, that was easy because there were criminal prosecutions in the United States uh, regarding some of the uh, alleged payments. Uh, and I mean, that's more of a criminal law matter. But I think one of the things in international sports is that you're seeing more involvement by the U.S. Attorney's Office and given jurisdictions dealing with that corruption. That doesn't really go to arbitration. That's more of a, right. a general corruption issue or how we would define it as corruption, let me say. Exactly. I think if uh, no one else has any thoughts on international arbitration, I think we can move over to the subject of inter of arbitration overall and how our speakers feel on the growing trend in the use of arbitration. I know offline you guys have said uh, made comments on trends you've noticed between clients and so on. I was going to throw one thing out, Ben, which Chris was nice enough to respond to someone on the chat which we've heard a lot about in the last 24, 36 hours, which is the uh, essentially referees or umpires and whether or not we've talked about coaches and players and whether or not the, the umpires and the uh, officials in the different leagues are unionized and whether or not they negotiate CBAs. And I thought maybe Chris, you want to just comment since you were nice enough to answer the chat question, especially in lieu of the, the umpire who ejected the player the other day, uh, the catcher, and has been an outcry that he should be fired and, and not be able to umpire any major league games this year. How does that play out in terms of your knowledge of the CBA? Yeah, I mean, um, I believe I more I know for sure the NFL and NBA referees are unionized. I believe the umpire, maybe the baseball umpires are as well. Yes, they are. <laughs> and just like um, with the players, there have occasionally been lockouts and strikes, some with uh, you know comical effect. Uh, I think there was a, a Monday Night Football game that was a disaster six or seven years ago because the NFL referees were on strike and the NFL used replacement referees. Um, the NFL is interesting because for a long time, the referees weren't full-time employees. Uh, anyone who knows, remember that Hockley, who was a successful, I believe, attorney in Arizona. Um, uh, but there are more, um, now they have some full-time uh, referees in the NFL, but otherwise they're negotiating over the same things, uh, or a lot of the same things that, that most American workers are, which is pay and hours and job requirements, benefits, those kinds of things. Um, and then, and obviously in there somewhere is going to be grievance processes. Um, and, and I think leagues sometimes are, they would probably argue are hamstrung a little bit in the ways in which and how they can get rid of uh, problematic um, employees. And uh, just like in any other industry, um, you have to go through a, a grievance process and the union's going to fight it. 
and uh, you you can you can certainly lose. And there's going to be sort of in, internal industrial case law about what does or does not constitute a fireable offense. So it's going to be interesting to see if anything does happen. I have not heard anything yet today. I've been a little busy, but whether or not Major League Baseball has done anything in reaction, because there's a public outcry that's pretty strong. Uh, with regard to potentially disciplining that umpire. It'll be interesting to see if they do anything or they just sort of let that one go because I believe he's a fairly new uh, umpire in the system. I think he's only had a couple years of experience. But I just thought the video of that was pretty amazing uh, with him, you know, yeah. missing the glove because the catcher moved his glove and all of a sudden he's throwing him out of the game. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously it wasn't a spring training game. That could have had some real ramifications to the outcome of the game because obviously the catcher on the Phillies is a, a well-respected, uh, excellent player. Right. Ben, to your discussion, your your question more generally, you know, uh, I'm sometimes now I, I, my career has been split. I'm doing similar to Greg and being on both sides, both management and also on the employee or or labor side. And I am sometimes surprised today with the vitriol with which uh, plaintiff side, employee side um, counsel view the arbitration process. Um, you know, in the in the normal context, you know, the employer has to pay for the arbitration, and that's tremendous leverage um, for the employee. Uh, arbitrations cost fifty to hundred grand, and so an employee who brings a non meritorious arbitration, uh, oftentimes the company would rather just pay them thirty five or seventy five grand to go away rather than 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 um, pay the arbitration fees. Um, you know, there are lots of articles written out there about the employees have very low success rates in arbitrations. That's because meritorious cases get settled. Um, and there's a lot of non-meritorious cases and companies occasionally decide to go to the mat. Otherwise, the plaintiff's bar, particularly in California, um, just will continue to file non-meritorious cases. Uh, in the sports context, I don't think there's any question uh, generally that, that both the leagues and the unions want an arbitration process. Um, the league, the unions, particularly the NFLPA, I, I know this for a fact, they want confidentiality just as much as the league does. They don't want dirty laundry being aired. They don't want the NFLPA's uh, potential failures or missteps being aired. And that's why sometimes the unions, particularly the NFLPA, ends up um, being sued by players as well. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, the union and the league, uh, they're, they're much, they, they work, they're on the phone together every day. And they they are working on things, and they want only those two parties to know what's going on, and that often includes the arbitration process. One thing um, I'll add to that, which is interesting, Ben, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, Greg, real quick, let me just do the last CLE credit. Sure. And let's finish your thoughts. Um, so the last CLE credit for everyone, I'll I'll give it a second so everyone's paying attention. The last CLE credit for everyone, the code is football. I'll say it one more time for everyone that didn't hear. The last CLE credit code is football. Please. Off. Okay, Ben, I was just going to say, I thought Chris made a good point. You know, in the industrial setting, non-sports, the one thing that I've seen really uh, become more frequent is uh, individual employees who don't believe that they are being represented fully, meaning I want to have my case heard in front of an arbitrator. I think I was unjustly suspended or terminated, whatever it might be. Uh, in the past, they might be unhappy with the union, but they might walk away if the union didn't progress and go to an arbitration setting. And as Chris said, it's very expensive. So a lot of unions would rather not go with eh, kind of weak cases and get in front of an arbitrator because, again, it's expensive for them to pursue that option with hiring attorneys and whatnot. And what we've seen is a higher incidence of late of individual employees filing unfair labor practice charges, or as we're known as 8B charges, against unions because unions have a duty of fair representation. So they're being employees are being much more aggressive uh, with challenges to their own union sometimes, claiming that the union is not duty, not honoring their duty of fair representation uh, by pushing forward and arguing, uh, they're arguing even credibly uh, the case on their behalf. So it's just an important point to mention, another change that we've seen uh, lately with uh, individual, individual employees being a little bit more aggressive in terms of their demands of their unions. I think in the sports realm, uh, arbitration certainly has been a plus and all the points that are made are really good ones. Uh, you have you know, sophisticated unions, you have um, sophisticated management, if you will. Uh, there's a maturity of arbitration law too, because in many countries, it's not that frequent. I mean, but in the United States, you know, the Federal Arbitration Act 
will be what 100 years old, I think, uh, in a couple of years. I mean, it's, it's been around. So I think that's a good sign. But I do think for the public at large, because this is an arbitration dispute resolution panel, I think many would feel if they're going to be uh, claiming employment discrimination, not to have that or the possibility of going to trial and having information publicly known uh, does shield the defendant, you know, whether the case is, you know, assuming the case has some merit to it. And I do think that that's some of the um, objection in a more general vein. You know, I'm not going to speak about Flores because Flores is a kind of unique employee, but a more average employee, let us say, who works in a for a team, uh, if they were um, under this arbitration clause, then I think the problem will be from, from their lawyer's point of view, you know, the issue will not get the public attention. And I think they would rather bring that case in the court of public opinion. And I think that's possibly why some of those feelings do occur. So it's been great to hear everyone's thoughts. We have approximately nine minutes left. We have to end it at 6.45. I know that there's been some questions in the chat. I see Chris has been doing a great job answering them. If anyone else has any questions or if you guys have any closing remarks that you'd love to say or to reach out to you or anything, I think now would be the perfect time. I'm just looking at some of the questions, Ben. No worries, no worries. I think everyone's just digesting because I think we just talked about a lot of great stuff, you know? Well, the one thing I'll touch on quickly, one of the questions was about the Brewers uh, and the arbitration with their Cy Young Award winner and the nastiness or the bitterness that arose coming from that. And again, I'm not here to criticize the agent. I'm not here to criticize the team. But again, it's important to remember, whenever you go into that room, you go in to win. And again, we never try and make it personal, only in the sense of personal in terms of their success, their attributes, how they performed between the lines, unless they've done something really egregious, which is also another factor, good or bad, that can be entered into evidence for the arbitrator's consideration. So uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, I'm sure there are different things that are going to be done to try and patch up that relationship between the team and the player. Uh, but on that one, I sort of, I look to the agent a little bit who I have no idea who he is or who she is, as that's a role the agent has to play to make sure the player, as I said earlier, is prepared for the process. I think there was just a shock that someone who was a Cy Young Award winner could ever go to arbitration and not have a successful hearing. And I think that was all part of it, was just the outright shock that he had lost the hearing. But again, some of that sensitivity is, is really uh, an important factor, an important role uh, for an agent to play to to really condition his player and make sure the player is prepared for that. Greg, maybe someone's asked a question. Talk about how um, the use of data and analytics has changed salary arbitration over the last decade or so. so that's a great question. I've never answered that one. I didn't see it yet. Thank you, Chris. It really has changed quite a bit. Uh, the one challenge we still have, though, is because we only have an hour, some of this data and some of the information that is now put, put forth, you don't want to take five minutes explaining what it is and what it means. Uh, and the bottom line is that's always a challenge because you have to assume that if the arbitration panel doesn't understand the specific new data or the new type of statistic that's been introduced by fan graphs or somewhere else, you're not going to get the value of it. So that's an excellent question I've posed. It's something that, you know, several years ago, some of the, uh, some of the issues that are now common terms uh, in baseball, statistical data and information from fans are now admissible and they probably were always admissible, but now they're more well known. So again, that's part of it has changed drastically. Whereas we used to have more of a batting average, you know, ERA, those type of general statistics, statistics, we're now seeing a much broader base of statistics that are being introduced by both sides. And the only caution I give is that we want to make sure that whatever statistic we're being uh, going to be presenting is certainly going to be understood by the arbitration panel and not just a, a nuance that has really not become a, an, ex, an accepted statistical criteria. I will say this, and in a couple of cases I've had over the years, I have used some of very unique statistics, but I've taken the moment or two to try and explain it and just almost use it as a, not as a true stat that I want them to rely and think that we're going to win or lose our case on, but just present it as something that's informational, uh, that the arbitrators can have knowledge about if they don't already have it, that they should consider as they're rendering their decision, along with the other information that we provided to them during our presentation. Well, Greg, do you think this, the salary arbitration would ever be eliminated from baseball, as is sometimes discussed and what might take its place? Oof. You know, that, that's a tough question. I think, as, as, as Mark had said earlier, 
you know, I think all the leagues who have arbitration value arbitration as a process. Uh, there's certainly been a push to try and eliminate arbitration the same way there's been a, a push to create a salary cap in baseball. Uh, and, you know, that argument, I think it's weakened as salaries escalate on an annualized basis. We're seeing a minimum salary. When I first started working as an agent, the minimum salary in the major leagues was 60000 You know, now it is certainly a lot larger than that, approaching getting pretty darn close to a million dollars. I think it's seven fifty this year is the minimum salary. And, and then when I did Tommy Glavin's contract, I can tell you that it was the largest contract in history for a pitcher for about two weeks until Greg Maddox renewed his, but it was $32 million for four years. So think about that. And that was not 100 years ago. And now we're looking at a player is making 40, 45, potentially more than that on an annualized basis. So I don't think the salary cap argument is going to go too far. I don't think that the, the bottom line, the union is going to want to accept it and negotiate it. And I don't think, frankly, the owners at this point are going to give up the salary arbitration process because the one thing that people have to realize, and I think Chris said it earlier, it's not only the case that they go to a hearing, it's how the process is utilized by both sides to try and avoid hearings. And I remember several years ago, I had a question at a, at a law school when I was speaking and someone said it was the one freak year when there were absolutely no hearings. And the person asked the question, they said, well, doesn't this, doesn't this mean that the arbitration system has failed? And I said, no, quite to the contrary. It means that the arbitration system is working because the goal of the arbitration system is to encourage settlements. It's not to encourage hearings. So the reality is that one you know, blip of a year was actually a very successful year. And I think both sides view it as an opportunity to try and negotiate settlements and try to avoid hearings. You know, when you start a process with well over 100 potential hearings every year, and usually you get it down to somewhere in the teens, uh, I would argue that means the process is working because both sides are coming to negotiated resolution as opposed to an arbitration driven one. Yeah, I, I want to touch on that a little bit, which again, the baseball arbitration is sometimes referenced and I think used in other commercial or other contexts. And, and it certainly can and, and should be because again, the point is to require the arbitrator uh, to pick uh, whose case, whose side they, they, they believe in and, and they're not allowed to go down the middle. And that forces both sides to come to the middle. And as Greg was saying, that results in, in the, clubs and the players coming up with sort of very funky numbers, just trying to get $1 better than the other side. Um, and there's, there's sort of a little bit of, of game theory in trying to figure out, well, if I go here and they go there and we go here, uh, where, where, where do I have the advantage? Um, so, I mean, this is a general arbitration panel. I mean, if you want to get creative, uh, baseball's last best offer arbitration process uh, is definitely amenable to, um, to resolving the dispute. Mark, if there's anything else you want to say before we all head, head out, then we'll be done. Uh, I just would just reiterate what has been said. I think that you're going to see arbitration in sports uh, for the foreseeable future uh, in both international and domestic settings. I think there'll be changes. I mean, i hoping privately that the NFL system would be changed because I think it is the outlier. And I think that it is more problematic than in the, all the other sports, as we've said, for all the reasons that we've said. So, you know, my goal is if you think about arbitration as dispute resolution that is, you know, fair and impartial, that's the one thing I'd say. And of course, internationally, I could don't want to go all night about all the issues that go on there, arbitration and otherwise. But, you know, just um, I learned a lot. And I just want to say that um, anybody's welcome to come to my class to speak. I think uh, the perspectives were really fascinating. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Give a special shout out to our speakers. This was a very interesting conversation. I also want to give a shout out to the ADR program and the Sports Law Society. And just a reminder that the Sports Law Society Symposium is this Thursday and Friday. There will be Zoom sessions Thursday night and in-person and Zoom sessions on Friday. So please feel free to register and contact me if you need the registration details. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.